and welcome to all of you. Um, can you hear me at the back? Good. If, 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 if I start getting a bit faint, wave at me and I will I'll try and speak up a bit. Um, so welcome to everybody. The theme of the conference is Archaeology in Context. And in this conference session, we want to talk about self-employment in the archaeological context, in all of its various different archaeological contexts. And in this introduction, I'm hoping to set the context for our discussion this afternoon. I'll start with a bit of personal background. I've been working for myself since early 2003. And before that, for 14 years, I worked for the County Archaeological Service of Hereford and Worcester, later Worcestershire County Council, in a variety of roles, mostly in the contracting field archaeology side, but also gaining experience in the then Sites and Monuments record, and I did a maternity cover role working as a planning archaeologist. By the end of 2002, I decided to leave the County Archaeological Service, but did not have any clear idea about what I wanted to do or where I wanted to work, other than it needed to be in reach of Worcester. I decided I might try working for myself, and because of the committee work I'd done for the IFA, and because I was in the right place at the right time, my first freelance work was for IFA, working for Kenny Aitchison on Profiling the Profession 2002-3. And from that piece of work, um, other collaborations followed with Jill Chitty, who was then a freelance heritage consultant, and then with Jill Chitty and David Baker, and subsequently working on projects either on my own or with others. I've ended up in specialising in projects about archaeology or about archaeologists. They're kind of things that oil the wheels of the profession in some way. And it's kind of hard enough to explain to archaeologists what I do, let alone to non-archaeologists. Um, I don't, it's kind of easier to say what I don't do. So I don't do development related archaeology, I don't do field work, I don't work with artefacts or ecofacts. Um, the nearest I've got to real archaeology, if, you, if there is any such thing, um, is working for various different HERs on the Natural England Shine project uh, programme, creating GIS records in rural areas for management purposes. <coughs> My freelance work has developed in quite an organic or eclectic way, depending on the opportunities available. So getting back to the context of the session, as Katrina said, last summer she contacted me for advice about tendering for work with English Heritage, and then Chris Cox also got in touch asking about daily rates in general. And this led me to think about one aspect of site self-employment, which is that of working um, working alone, often without other people to discuss things with, and feeling that one's working it out all on one's own. And so the idea of a conference session was born. Katrina agreed to collaborate with me in organising it. CIFA accepted our session proposal, and here we are today. We're not the first to talk about self-employment in archaeology. Um, different aspects have been discussed in print by people outside and within CIFA, including Paul Blinkhorn, Chris Cumberpatch, Phil Mills, and Jerry Martin. Seif and Badger have each produced guidance documents on different aspects of self-employment. But what we're hoping to achieve today is a more wide-ranging discussion, opening out a broad range of issues relevant to those working in a whole variety of different specialisms and roles. We hope to cover positive aspects of self-employment as well as the negative. We want it to be relevant both to those who are already self-employed and to those who are considering this as an option. We hope not to get bogged down in too much detail, and for that reason we've put, put together the fact sheet that um, Katrina mentioned. Um, CIF has made this available online, and there's hard, there are an, I think they've got 20 hard copies, so help yourselves. Um, as the afternoon progresses, we may well refer to this if people are asking questions about specific details, because hopefully that will cover some of the sort of fact-based things um, that people may be concerned about. In the session, we don't expect to find answers to everything or solve the underlying structural problems raised by some self-employed specialists. Um, we don't, we're also not going to send you away fully equipped to start your freelance career tomorrow. So if you come for that, apologies, but um, it takes a little bit, little bit longer than one afternoon session, so um, bear with it. Um, 
We do hope to provide an opportunity to discuss some of the issues together and perhaps begin to identify some potential ways forward, <coughs> or at least some different ways of thinking about things. Moving on to setting the scene a bit more, um, I'll just try a, a, to attempt an, a, a characterisation of archaeological self-employment in the UK today. I'd originally hoped to collect more information and give you something approaching a, a sort of reliable summary, but as I'll say later, things didn't go as planned. So what I'm offering is sort of my own opinion, supplemented by a very small non-scientific survey of current and former freelance archaeologists. So who are self-employed archaeologists? Men and women, maybe more women than men, of all ages, but with a tendency to be a bit older and a bit more experienced, rather than fresh out of university. Some people choose self-employment as a definite career move, and others fall into it in some way, as I have myself. Some people have periods of self-employment and employment, some combine both at the same time, some find self-employment congenial and stick with it, and others run back to employment as fast as they possibly can. <laughs> Most specialisms are represented, including, including fieldwork and development-related consultancy, but especially artefacts, ecofacts and illustration work. Less so scientific analysis that requires expensive equipment. Despite what some people believe, self-employed diggers are used routinely to work on sites managed and supervised by others especially in certain parts of the country. Problems and difficulties of archaeological self-employment include fluctuating workloads, feast or famine, with nobody to share the feast, resulting in some late nights and or early mornings. Isolation, lack of people to share your triumphs or tri tribulations with, or offer advice or support. Quality insurance can be something that you need to think about and find a way around. There can be difficulties with those who commission your work. Um, in some cases, information isn't supplied, sudden changes in programmes, delays to programmes. Maintaining appropriate standards for your work can be an issue. Charging a reasonable rate. Managing your infrastructure, including IT. Fitting the work into your house, flat or garden shed. Fitting work around your life and family. But that brings me to some of the advantages, because a significant proportion of self-employed archaeologists find that fitting work around your life and family is a positive benefit. Other advantages include being your own boss, being in charge, in some cases, of your own standards, being able to work from anywhere so you're not restricted to, um, if you need to move to another part of the country. So going back to me, self-employment began, began after I'd reached me for level. As I've implied, my work relies on me being a generalist, not a specialist in any particular period or artefact type. I started freelance work at the age of 39. I didn't need the flexibility it can offer to those with children, but flexibility is an aspect that I very much appreciate. When I'm lucky enough not to have a pressing deadline, I can go out and enjoy a sunny day if I want to. And I was able to give time to help my parents when my mother had a stroke two years ago. However, I have had some very lean times, and it is probably true to say that in my case, archeological self-employment would not have made me a living. Thanks to my husband, also an archaeologist, who remained employed by Worcestershire until taking voluntary redundancy in 2013, self-employment was possible. Had I been on my own or had children, I would have had to find additional work of some kind. Another advantage I had was being married to an archaeologist and having someone on hand who could read through and comment on reports for me and just provide informed advice and support. But this is where my story gets difficult. The year after my husband, Hal Dalwood, had left Worcestershire and started his own self-employed business, he collaborated on a tender to English Heritage to carry out a review of reference resources used by archaeological specialists and won it. We were absolutely delighted. Initially things went well, then there were some delays and problems with the project. But we just managed to sort these out when Hal fell ill. After a month of waiting and tests and him getting iller and iller, he was diagnosed with secondary cancers on the 20th of August last year. Three months of more waiting, uh, more tests, diagnosis, hospitalisation, optimism, followed by crises followed. 
but ultimately his body could not take the treatment which could have cured him, and he died in November. And my life is not the same anymore. So why am I telling you this? Well, firstly, because self-employment can bring the personal and the professional much closer together than when one is employed and going out of the house and family space to work every day. And for some people, this closeness is a good thing and an easy thing, but other people may find it more of a challenge. Secondly, I'm telling you this because it's kind of a cautionary tale. In our historic England tender, Hal and I included medium-term illness amongst the risks to the project, but stated that this was A, unlikely, and B, would not have a significant impact, as each of us could take over for the other. But as things turned out, his illness proved to be much, much worse. Neither of us could continue working, and the project has been stalled since August. I've been fortunate because Historic England have been very understanding and have revised aspects of their wider programme to manage without results that we've not yet got for them. And so far, I'm not properly back to work, though I've managed a few meetings and done some NPQ assessing. I've not yet got back to that project. But what this suggests to me is that maybe we all need to think a little about disaster planning in self-employment. What would we do if things went badly wrong? Hal's death is perhaps an extreme, but can we manage financially if we were to fall ill for some time? Or if a family member were seriously ill, how would our clients react? Disaster planning in larger organisations tends to focus on fly fire and flooding, and whilst we should not ignore these possibilities, we need to bear in mind that as single person organisations, the greatest vulnerability is the fact that there's only one of us. Usually, most of the time, we cope with the stressful times when we need to work long days to get it all done. But sometimes it can go all wrong. And I would be now be an advocate for considering income protection insurance if you rely on your self-employment for financial stability. D despite Hal's death, I wanted to continue my involvement with this, this session today rather than withdrawing from it or cancelling it or anything like that. I felt excited by the idea of opening out a discussion, of sharing, of feeling less isolated, of acknowledging the positive aspects of self-employment alongside the challenges. I don't know where this will lead, if anywhere, but hopefully, at the very least, we will have had an interesting discussion, met some new people and gained new contacts by the end of the afternoon. The next two speakers before tea are Chris Cox, will be talking about her own extensive and successful experience of self-employment as Director of Airfacto Services. And then Victoria will talk about those, what those who commission self-employed archaeologists want. After tea, we've got a panel of self-employed specialists, each of whom will introduce themselves and raise some topics for discussion. Liz Gardner is an illustrator, Matilda Holmes an archaeozoologist, Oliver Jessup is a heritage consultant, John Kenny a community archaeologist. John Martin, a field worker, and Stephanie Ratkai, a pottery and post excavation specialist. So between us all, we should be able to get an interesting discussion going, and for those who come wanting to know a bit more, hopefully one of us or several of us may be able to answer your questions. But before we move on, I think the third reason I wanted to talk about Hal's death is that it has brought home how unpredictable and potentially short life can be. And we should all take this to heart. Think about what you want to do with your life or what you want to try and just do it. You may not have as long as you think, so if you want to try self-employment for a while, just do it. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Chris from uh, Photo Services. And I'd like to thank Rachel for asking me to come and speak today and take part in this session. Um, can you hear me at the back? <clears throat> Good. Um, self-employment has been a major, major part of my life. And it was my cho is my chosen career path, as Rachel put it quite aptly. I chose to become self-employed and I planned to do it. Um, following a degree in Egyptology at Liverpool, where I discovered aerial archaeology as a, or aerial photographs as a survey method. I was doing some surveying in some desert-based survey. I knew from the minute I looked on them, I want to work with this. It's almost 
I love, oh, I love doing this. I want to do this for the rest of my professional life. So I don't just want to do one thing with it. I want to do lots of things with it. And I didn't really quite know where to start, but I took, um, was very fortunate in being accepted onto a master's degree course at Sheffield to study air photo interpretation for archaeology. Did an awful lot of flying photography, practical work, and learned a huge amount in one year. And I met the person with whom I formed our photo services, Rog Palmer, who was working in Cambridge on similar things several years ahead of me. He's 18 years older than me and has concomitantly a lot more experience of specialist aerial photographic work. And we just worked together at, uh, on our university projects. I joined the Aerial Archaeology Research Group on its second session in 1984. And together we've taken that group quite a long way. Um, I've got the original paper from it. It's quite interesting. It's typed out in Korea on a piece of real paper. So it was good. Um, and I planned to become self-employed, but I knew I didn't quite have the experience straight away to do that. I come from a business background anyway. My dad was self-employed, and I've seen it. I've seen computer sales at the sharp end through the 1960s and 70s. The ups and the downs of a family reliant on a buoyant, but as Rachel has said, famine and feast type business with one person at its head. So. And my, my dad was an accountant and had a lot of friends who were accountants, lawyers, and in the financial sector. So we did live self-employment throughout my childhood and young adulthood. But that wasn't the reason I wanted to become self-employed. I wanted to be able to do work relating to aerial imagery, and I knew how it would develop as technology advanced for the whole of my working life. And I knew that one organisation probably would not have the employment for me to fill a post all the time, unless I joined the then Royal Commission um, uh, photo units. But I didn't feel that was the right sort of career path for me at that time. So I decided that I took um, six years experience in field archaeology, aerial archaeology, went on, on manpower services, went to work for um, Lancaster University unit, who are now OA North, uh, as their aerial archaeologist on the Northwest Ethylene Pipeline. It was a very demanding job and very interesting for me, and it really consolidated my experience to a point in 1990 where I got um, MIFA status. I thought it was important to be both qualified, experienced, resilient, and have that accreditation of my professional organisation behind me. And on the back of PPG 16 in 1990, Roger and I started our business as a partnership on the first day of the tax year, on April 6, 1990. Uh, we're 26 years old now as a, as a company. And we've both done quite a lot of, with our company. Um, we started with work in hand, um, good work in hand, um, English Heritage funded work in hand. Um, I continued my employment for a year throughout 1990, worked both. But in the November of that year, gave up the day job, moved to Cambridge, and we spread our time between Swindon and Cambridge to access the archives of aerial photographs. I spent two periods out in consultancy um, between 2000 and 2004 at CGMS, a planning consultancy, which was really, really useful and interesting, where I developed expert witness capabilities. And I've also spent time with the Waterman Group for two years in um, engineering consultancy, working in a multidisciplinary team. So I've always made myself look outwards from my own very, very introspective, <laughs> inward-looking and intense discipline in order to feel part of something bigger and be able to deliver quite a wide range of services. And I was, um, I was 29 when I started my self-employment. So that's it's been quite a long time, and we, we are now no longer a partnership, we're a limited company that Roger and I direct. We have an office in Swindon near the Historic England offices. We have um, Roger's office in Cambridge in his home. I chose to move my business out of my home because I have young adults living with me, teenagers, children then, and I did want that separation of the two for me and them. Um, I didn't. I got to a point where I didn't want to be sharing confidential planning work in a house full of teenagers. So <laughs> that's uh, that's basically just a bit about where I'm coming from. Um, and I look at it from a viewpoint of skills. 
And, is that, and what I'm actually trying to want to tell you today is just my view on it. I'm not telling you what to do, and I wouldn't dream of putting my values into, I don't know anything about the businesses you want to run, but um, I think that skill is very important. And people can make statements, so I've got this statement up here. I thought it was quite funny, but it's not really true. Tired of trying to cram her sparkly star-shaped self into society's beige square holes, she chose to embrace her ridiculous awesomeness and shine like the freaking supernova she was meant to be. <laughs> Sounds lovely, yes, yes, we'd all like to do that. However, I think that statement, is that optimism or a sense of entitlement? Because nobody's actually meant to be anything. That word meant impl implies that we all think we should have something. And that all of a sudden, if you go self-employed and you do something, I really agree with Rachel, I think to just do it is a wonderful thing. I planned to just do it and did it in a measured manner with other things behind me. But I think we need more than a sense of optimism. We do need, or I feel, we do need skills which are um, measurable, skills which are accredited, and skills which are saleable and will be respected and actually underpin your business with your own skill. Um, and I want to look in this presentation. Um, how do we translate skill and aspiration into reality and business success? That's something um, I had to think of very carefully in running my business. Now, we all want, want to do something which we feel passionate about, we've got skills to do it. I don't doubt that. Everybody in this room has probably got something to, to offer as a self-employed specialist or consultant, whatever. But I think that we ought to think carefully about how we promote our businesses. I did an awful lot of work about marketing, I access Chamber of Commerce things, I am quite interested in business. But I think we ought to stop selling and start helping. Uh, we have some photos up here of my colleague Rebecca, who's in the audience here. Sorry about this, Rebecca. Uh, training us in the office and working with us. And we, we do aim, in the courses we run and in the work that we do, we aim to help people in many, many different areas. That's what we do. We assist people to do things or be things or get planning permission. And we've not had to hard sell things. And I don't actually think for us that's the, the best way. Our products are our reports, our advice. For us, we always set out for this to be high quality and to let them speak for themselves and help people. And I really believe quite passionately in that concept. And one piece of advice I give to anyone starting out in, our, in archaeological stuff, I'm very particularly, never ever assume that somebody knows what we do, because they don't. Most of our clients don't really know exactly what we do on a daily basis, and neither do they, do they particularly want to, unless we're doing something really, really interesting, which 95% of the time I'm not. Um, it's what we can do for them, not what we actually do that matters, because they can't do it themselves and they need it. They may not want it, they do need it. We need to open the black box of what is this we do in a very simple manner and communicate with our clients or our potential clients what we can actually do for them. What are the benefits of having me working for you doing our own photographs? People just don't really know. So it's very important to communicate what we're doing to people in an effective and friendly and accessible manner. And there's loads of resources out there for business. I started off in, in business before the internet. And it was really amazing when we got the internet. In 96, we got our first web, um, first internet address, and then we had a website in 98. You can find an awful lot of very good personal, physical, technological, and financial resources. I use the resources at Funding Circle quite a lot. And incidentally, Funding Circle are actually a very small business-friendly way of raising money for your business if you need things. But that's entirely up to you how you work the finances of the business. But our resources are actually quite um, extensive if we want them. Um, what I wanted to explore as well in looking at what, what are we resourcing and looking at want versus need and really understanding what we're selling. Um, understanding and fulfilling clients' needs, I'm coming back to this because it's important, is the basis really for me of all successful sales. And this, to me, translates in, into risk management, 
knowledge, solutions to problems, and planning compliance. That's what I really sell. And you'll see here there's several people doing things. Someone excavating a trench, photograph taken by a consultant, um, advising on a site, myself and Rebecca teaching people about LIDAR, me looking at aerial photographs, pottery analysis, all these skills that we've got. We need to see where and how our clients need them. And I started off my business on the basis of an actual need, which was to fulfill the terms and conditions of PPG 16 and all the iterations since. Um, and I, I thought that was a sensible thing to do because people suddenly needed our services. Um, I think Rachel has very eloquently and very well touched on this, which is close to my heart as well, risk. And only you know the risks to your business. There's some risks that are universal. I would not fly a light aircraft into this cloud for anything. <laughs> and when you're doing your flying tests, because I was lucky enough to be able to learn to fly for an aerial server and do quite a lot of flying in light aircraft, you are given a test, and just like a driving test, and the examiner asks you, says, turn left 10 degrees, turn right 10 degrees, they test that you can change the direction of your aircraft. A, you wouldn't dream of taking off on a solo flight if you couldn't land. And C, B, when you're taking a test, they always direct you to a cloudy area and tell you to fly into it. The ability to say no, not only to overt risks, no, I'm not crossing that road, I'll get run over, but no to projects that are beyond your capacity, no to people who want you to do things that you really don't want to do. To be able to say no in a constructive manner. I have honestly, over the last few years, turned away more projects than I've accepted. Because I know that they are either unattainable, badly funded, or I just can't do them. And it's really good to be able to know yourself and have the confidence to say no. It's dead easy to say, yeah, I'll do that. But not really think it through. And I'm speaking from great experience here on this. What are you doing? And a concept I looked at previously, reality. And it's, um, I fully believe in this maxim, be gentle with yourself. You're doing the best you can. Do not be too self-critical. I'm desperately self-critical and end up stressed most of the time because of it. But it's, you ask yourself, is your best appropriate to the needs of your business? What does your business really need? And be totally honest with yourself about your strengths and weaknesses and capacity for doing things. I am rubbish at accounts. I can't work Excel. I can't do DIY. So I have people who help me with these things. I even get my accountant to check my invoices to see if they're added up correctly. And I've put the right, right amount of VAT on them. But I realise that. I'm very good at managing my own time. In fact, I work too much. And of course, we all take it for granted that we're good at doing what we do. I'm OK at doing our photos. And this brings me on to the concept, a concept that Rachel has introduced isolation and the feeling that you're all on your own. I was very fortunate in, and still am in having a business partner who, now although semi-retired, has worked with me untiringly to develop our business and to make it what it is today and to help me in by arguing with me a lot of the time. and provide, it's, it's wonderful it's to have someone to argue with, to have someone to say, no, you're not doing that, that's rubbish. And then to be able to bat it backwards and forwards. And, my team is very important to me, and I, I can't, we can't often afford to employ people, so I've got a really good network of friends, people like Rebecca, Rachel, people I know, who I can ask if I have a problem or an issue that I want to discuss. From the big teams that run a commercial airliner, you find yourself on the flight deck of a big commercial airliner with hundreds of passengers on board. Those three pilots here, they're flying it, but they're supported by a big team of people who ground crew, stewards, it's a very expensive operation to get that aircraft in the air and get it down again. But my team consists of different people. The people who work in the office below me at Foundations Archaeology, I can go and ask them for things. And If my computer breaks or something, I can go, so would you, would you look at this for me? It's really important not to be on your own with unpleasant things. And my friend Claire King and my accountant here, you see them putting my shelves together because they wouldn't let me do it because I must be rubbish with a hammer and I'd probably hurt myself. Um, and we all know people, accountants, lawyers, bankers, financial advisors, we need these people, ask, ask for them. Insurance brokers, friends, colleagues, partners, former employers, 
clients, suppliers, people that you know. I guarantee everyone in their family will have people they know. And people who've got skills are always very glad to be asked for advice. And I've really, really benefited from this. One thing I will say though, I never stepped out of my door without insurance. The first thing we took out was professional indemnity insurance, all, all the rest of it, before we even touched a contract. We took out insurance on ourselves, so if we died or something awful happened to us, or like happened to me in 2011, I became ill and had to stay off work for a whole year. Fortunately, I recovered. And I ended up in a situation where my clients had put my work aside for me because we have a good relationship with our clients. I picked it up again, but I was insured. So I had income protection insurance. I wouldn't be able to get it now because I've been ill. And it's really important that while, while you're well, while you're starting out, to me anyway, take that out because my family would really have suffered more, more than they did when I was ill if I did not have income protection insurance. And it's a core part of my business to have my insurances and all my people in place to help me. And that allows me to work alone most of the time, but knowing that I've got things behind me. And I would like to ask you, wherein lies the value? Every business has a different value, because everybody has different values. My business is a family business. It's run on a tight commercial consultancy basis, delivering value to clients who seek planning permission, securing land, complying with regulations, and we work in heritage, legal, training, planning, humanitarian, environmental. I've really diversified it in order to underpin if one sector fails, I have other work I can bring in underneath. And that's really important to me. As because I have such a long experience, I can sell my PI skills in lots of different areas. And that's important to me. It's something you may develop as you go through your business. And incidentally, we also interpret aerial imagery. But my, my business looks after the things that are important to me up here on the right. My family, without whom I would not be able to do this. My eldest son helps with my business. He QAs things for me from across the world. I send him my reports. He's an English teacher. He reads them and sends them back to me with lots and lots of market on them. Then he is my associate director. He's grown up with this business since he, it's, we started it when he was two. Um, my partner, my business, well, my business partner, Rog, he's also part of this family. He's now retiring and retiring on the benefits that it's brought him. He's got a decent pension. He has an, a nice time. He interprets all the photographs for me part time and photographs and dances the rest of the time and has a really good time in his retirement because we've, we've done that deliberately for ourselves. But everybody will have different values they want to bring into their business. And I would reiterate it's got nothing to do with financial value that is your your choice how you run the finances it's to do with how it fits in with your life and how what it facilitates for you and i am really keen i really like my business because it it does for me what i need it gives me the flexibility it's allowed me to it supports our family as well it's allowed me to bring my children up and have that flexibility whilst working quite long hours which i didn't find while i was working out in other companies so i don't want to leave at five o'clock i don't I start at seven and get it finished and then perhaps take the morning off the next morning. That's the ideal. But it is, it's a valuable business to me. It allows me to travel. I can work from anywhere. There's internet. And it allows me to take my work anywhere. And that's, to me, that's a very, very big bonus. Um, think about your CPD. It's very important to me. Everybody thinks it's expensive, inconvenient, intrusive and unattainable. So what we did with it, it isn't expensive to go on big courses. It's expensive to come to a conference. It's expensive to be away from your family or away from people you're caring for. So we've introduced it right into the heart of our business as a lifelong learning and development through um, our professional group, which we have actually developed ourselves. We have a network of people, the Aerial Archaeology Group, all over the world to help us. And they come over and stay with us. If people come and be trained at our homes basically and not everybody would want to do this but a lot of our cpd is actually gone around our kitchen table and it's been really really useful to me to have these people who i can call upon who are now aerial archaeology professionals in other areas and other countries and if you want to visit another country or want to do something or one of my kids wants to go somewhere i can phone one of them they'll gratefully come running and say yes please come and visit us and it's really really nice i actually like that it is more a family and holistic to our work 
and we're able to offer people work experience, internships, work on occasions, collaborative work, partnership work on particular projects. So it's actually really a holistic approach I've taken to CPD and I've also invested a lot of money in it because I have taken training courses, I have gone on technical training courses, GIS, all sorts of things over the years because I want to learn, I want my business to be based on my skill, which I'm always learning. So I'll just leave you with this thought. We've come a long way in 26 years from no internet to satellites all over the place and things have moved really quickly. I have enjoyed the learning. I find it sometimes quite strenuous around a very busy commercial job. This was Rebecca will testify. <laughs> but it's very important to have your team on board to encourage you towards learning. And there's nothing better than teaching other people stuff to, to learn it yourself. And um, I just ask you all to think, where do you really want to go as you step outside the box of employment and step into self-employment? Where do you really want to go? And I'll leave you with that. Um, right, uh, my name is Victoria Bryant and I manage Mr. Charles Hagen Archaeology Service. Um, I have done a number of jobs in uh, in my, in my career, including um, being a fine supervisor, pottery specialist, uh, HER, a development control, um, and various other things, historical geography projects, this kind of thing. Um, so, but I haven't ever been a, a specialist, a, a self-employed specialist, so that's not where I'm coming from. And I'm very conscious that there's an awful lot of you here um, and and so what I might what I'm charged with doing is is giving you the other side of the picture now I'm sure probably an awful lot of you know it so if I'm teaching some of you to suck eggs I do apologize for that um, also I would say uh, hopefully you might agree with some of the things I say and that's great but if you don't and violently object that's also great so um, so here we go <laughs> right um, I have my own views, obviously my service uh, and previously in the past I've, have uh, commissioned pieces of work for all sorts of things in, um, and now it's archive sector and archaeology, learning and outreach, we have a commercial sector, so a, a commercial service, so that's, uh, we, we do a lot of that, but we also have quite a lot of internal in-house specialists as well. Um, and I have my own opinions, but I thought it might be an idea to actually ask a few other people. Um, not something I usually do, actually, but it's, <laughs> it's, it, it seemed really sensible. So um, what I've done is, I again, it's a small and non-scientific survey, and I did actually just choose to ask commercial field archaeology services, just because I was asking some... I want, when I got the answers back, I wanted them to be broadly in the same range that I could actually do something with them because obviously there's so many different specialisms. So so that's those who I asked. I, I, I asked medium medium side, medium to large side, large sized commercial archaeological organisations. And um, what I asked them was I, I asked them, so what do you think makes a good specialist? You know, what do, what are you looking for in a specialist? And then I asked them some other questions around particular topics. And those topics were cost, product, communication, and contracts. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about now very briefly. Um, good news, good news. Most people are really happy with their specialists. So there you go, so that's a start. <laughs> <laughs> Phew. So... <laughs> And, and also, they are, whatever they say to you, they are, are aware, very aware, that archaeology is complex, and if things go wrong, sometimes it's their fault, sometimes it's your fault, but more often than not, it's a bit of both. So that was very, that was very clearly stated. And to sum up at the beginning, so to speak, I'm just going to, you know, we'll get on to the detail, but to sum up, what they want is they want professional, business-like specialists who understand the pressures on, on them as the, as, as, as the people employing them and that, particularly because I'm just about to get onto cost, that profit margins, it's very competitive, commercial archaeology, mm -hmm. profit margins are very small and they have an awful lot of issues and obviously they love 
they would they want to work with people who get that it, it's like know your customer basically uh, is that so cost always a good one to start with um right now amazingly well i don't know what i thought i was going to find but it wasn't what i thought i'd find cost of specialist rates was not a big issue. Nobody thought that was a big issue. And one person said, we should be paying more, and I agree. Now, um, I'm not completely barking mad. Um, I, I share that view, and the reason is, I don't know, uh, I haven't really been involved in that. I've read the paper that, that Rachel's put out about how to determine your rates. Um, which is basically how much you want to earn a year um, divide by 100 and that's your daily, that's your daily rate it's in, right it's in the so when I thought about it and I thought well how do we determine our daily rates we do it slightly different to that but basically it comes out pretty much the same thing and and then I started to think well why we the great thing about one of the great things about uh, an external specialist you could say is it's a way of reducing the risk Internal specialists cost a lot more money because it's not about how much money do you want to earn, it's how much money you're going to have to pay them. So, and you have to pay them because you've employed them. So, you can't just say, Oh, just you know, just like, oh, I don't know, beans this week, you know, that, that strange enough doesn't wash. So, and we, so you're paying their wages, you're paying their pension, which um, in local authorities is about 20%, so it's high. Uh, quite right too. Uh, superannuation, you're paying for their sickness, you're paying for their holidays, you're paying for their training and you also know that they won't be working every working day which we estimate be about 193 to 200 days a year. Now if you put all that together that is a lot of money and, and it is that sort of money that specialists I think should be charging. You might say then why would you why you know but ah but we have a great advantage because actually you can charge less which indeed you can oh and i forgot about all the overheads i forgot about the it I forgot about the insurance i forgot about the buildings i forgot about the lighting computers all that kind of thing so i think talking from my talking from my own experience small companies obviously don't have the turnover to allow them to have in-house teams so they have to employ you and you are doing a professional job and they should be paying a professional fee. The middle size organisations, the middle and larger size organisations do want to have, are prepared to take the risk of paying out all that money and the risk of actually then jeopardising the business on very tight margins because they get advantages from having in-house um, specialists which is like rapid turnover and control I would say, you know, and you can, you know, and communication is easier. Um, but we in Worcestershire, of course, purchase external expertise for two reasons. One, because we don't have it ourselves, or a nice one, when well, we've got too much work. So those are, those are the reasons, and it's really important to us. And because it's really important to us, I don't think that, that you know, you should be earning proper money for that. Now, I've had many, I was heavily involved in NPRG, Medieval Pottery Research Group, for a number of years. And uh, obviously I've talked to an awful lot of specialists. And not everybody is of this opinion. And of course, um, most in, in, in the sense that I feel that specialists often, uh, uh, self-employed specialists often don't value themselves enough. And when you say that, they say, I, I mean, this isn't everybody, obviously, they're glorious exceptions, and I'm sure they're all in this room. But um, I have spoken to people who said, oh, well, you know, and I go, how much you charge? And they say to me, it's like a pittance. You know, they're the only person that knows about that stuff in that region. I'm talking medieval posture because that's what I know about. And you go, what? You can't be serious. You know, and they say, oh, yeah, but they won't pay us anymore. And I said, well, well what will happen? Where, who else are they going to go to? You know, and they, now there is a real concern which is very real which is that that might push things down to the lowest in other words they'll go and find some they'll go get their mother to do it or something you mm -hmm. know and i think this is not not this is a serious point but i think the way to deal with this is not for you to keep your prices low but for the curators to create an even playing field which is what we try to do in worcestershire so our if when if somebody is um either our own team or 
uh, or an external commercial archaeology service are putting in a written scheme of investigation. We insist that the senior people, including the specialists, have their names, their qualifications and their track record on those. So that we can see that it isn't just, you know, and, and so that's the fair, because everybody has to do the same. And also, when we get the reports in, we have quite tight standards and guidelines. And we check the reports as much as we can. Obviously, if it's a very specialist subject, we probably, you know, it's a bit harder. Not saying it's perfect, but I think that creates a level playing field. I cannot feel it's good for the profession in any area of it to have our wages pushed down. So that is my personal view, and clearly I'm not the only one. And what was interesting was from the survey is that it, that, that employers are much more interested in other things than that. So having said that, I'll get on to the other things. <laughs> so, the, um, so cost was one of the things I asked them about. Product was the other thing I asked them about. The second of four things I asked them about. They said what they want is a product that they can use and they need. In other words, they want a customer, they want to, they are your customer and they want you to produce something. Now, most of the time, clearly, that's what they get because they're broadly happy. Um, they don't need a thesis. And they also need you to understand, uh, even, you know, because even if you want to write it, and obviously you're not necessarily charging them anymore, they don't want it. In fact, it causes them problems because then they have to spend a lot of time editing the report. And then if they edit out your beautiful words, you, some people get a bit cross. So then we've got arguments, you know, and the point is they didn't actually want it in the first place and that's not what they paid for. Um, which is not to say you're not all extremely clever and couldn't write it. That's, that's not what we're saying here. Um, so they want, they want their specialists who understand the business. They, the, one of the interesting bits of feedback about that was they feel that is getting less of a problem. So it's not a huge problem and it's getting less of a problem. I think uh, the flexibility, they, they, want, they want specialists who engage and are flexible. So they deliver. I'm not talking about lowering standards here. That's not what this is about because the specialists know about the standards. They're the specialists. And they advise the teams on what you can, what what you actually can deliver within the money, and that's that's what they're expected to do. Um, so it's not about driving down standards; it's about being focused on what your customer needs and on what they're paying for. And of course, that's good for them because they're, if they're editing stuff and arguing with you and 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 getting all anxious about it, that's all costing money. And I know, as you know, it's like what. You know, we've just spent five hours on that. <laughs> it's like, we paid them. We wanted, I mean, obviously you're always going to do a bit of editing, but you want to basically to be able to slip uh, in. And, um, and we'll get on to how that might be achieved in a minute. Um, and obviously that largely is being achieved, but that was a really big thing, a really big thing. And also one of the things they said, they are much more likely to continue to use specialists who understand them and work with them. So in other words, they may not go back to you. Uh, I'm sure they will be very polite and they'll pay their bill, but they won't go back to you. Um, unless they absolutely have to, and then we'll get on to what might happen then later on. So I think it's not a big deal because clearly most people are happy, but it isn't any good anymore to go, well, actually, this is what I do, this is how I do it, and this is what you're gonna get. Um, Maybe those people are dying breed, I think. Or maybe they're dead already, that's good. Okay, so that comes on to how you, um, the, and the second really big thing, the really, really big thing, which you know, is touched on by Chris, communication. This is, this is the biggest thing. So everyone who responded said, this was the key to good partnership working and lack of it caused the most problems. And I think they probably recognized as well that that meant lack of it on their part as well as lack of it on any specialist class, you know, so it's not like they're the goodies and self-employed people are the badies. I don't think anybody actually was foolish enough to, to think that was the case. Um, and then another interesting thing, in the same way that they said, actually, you know, we're not really bothered about money, I mean, in that sense, if it's a fair playing field, and, um, and personally, I think, um, a lot of people said, that even what they called, you know, the really, see, you know, the really good specialists, I don't quite know what that means, were not proactive enough. 
they weren't, most of them, not all of them obviously, they thought they could be more confident, they could be more proactive, they could be asking more assertively, not rudely, but just being very clear about the information they needed before they started. Getting back to them immediately, there was a problem. So if the, if the, if the, they hadn't got what they needed, to go immediately say, oh, by the way, you know, I weren't starting because I haven't got stuff. Um, and then working with them to solve problems. So given the way archaeology is, it's very complex. Uh, every project is a problem, really, in one way or the other. So in other words, if they costed for something and then something had happened, say it was an archaeology, say, say it was pottery, you don't know about a bit, um, and you'd costed for it, and then it turned out there were lots more, there was more of it, then obviously immediately you need to get into negotiation with them. Do you need to change the methodology? Do you need to help them to get more money? You know, what, you know, in other words, work on it as a team. And, and, um, and most certainly not just do it all without charging more. Because I think that is, I'm, I'm sure nobody does that, but I don't think that that is not really a good idea because what will happen is people will carry on taking the piss out of you, to be honest. And, and, and that was the feeling that I got from talking to quite a lot of, of, of people, um, pottery specialists actually, because those were the people I was talking to. I got the feeling that they were being taken advantage of and, and, and they were allowing themselves to. Now, you know, hopefully none of you do that. Um, so working with them to solve problems and the other thing that they said, even the good ones, we have to chase to get the reports. Seemed a bit bizarre, so I'm just telling you that. Um, I mean, personally, if it were me, I'd have that report and the invoice in straight like that. I wouldn't need to be chased. But um, <laughs> and they also said it's a thing that that, uh, that Chris touched on. I think it's really important, but she said it much more eloquently. Is that over optimism is a really bad thing. Uh, so don't say you can do it if you can't, because nobody's happy. Um, obviously, when you're outside an organisation, communication is much more difficult than when you're inside an organisation. And God knows it's difficult enough with inside an, inside an organisation, I'm sure we all know that. But so I can't, you know, that clearly is what people are looking for. They're looking for engagement. And I don't mean site meetings. I mean picking up the phone, writing an email, you know, and passing documents back and forth as we haven't got. In the old days, we used to have lots of site meetings about stuff. It was fabulous. And then we all grew up. <laughs> and it all went pear-shaped. Right, and um, the final thing that I asked them about was contracts. Because I thought, hmm, right. Um, and when I say contracts, what I, what I actually mean is I mean penalty clauses. So I thought, oh, you know, Penalty clauses. How do people feel about penalty clauses? Um, and I got a very mixed. This is where I got a really mixed response to this one. Some people didn't do it, would never do it, don't like it, don't like the whole concept. I think archaeologists are not not keen on that kind of regulatory stuff. Even though we have to work with it for lots of our clients, we don't kind of we don't feel it's kind of proper within ourselves. Um, so there was that. Some people did do it but didn't like doing it, because they said neither their project managers nor the specialists liked it. Um, some didn't do it, but thought it might not be such a bad idea. <laughs> and some would definitely do this if they had to work with a specialist, who they, if they had to work with a specialist, who they knew was really bad at delivering on time. So in other words, if there is nobody else, and I do have to work with that person, I think I need to get something a bit tighter because they have caused me so many problems. I mean, somebody actually said, I don't want to go and have to apologise, you know, to the developers again with this, with regard to this person, you know. So, um, so I think, however, you know, you don't have to be terribly formal about this. And I would say the concept of a penalty clause could work both ways. I mean, it doesn't have to be formal, but I mean, if you have in writing, I need this before I start, you know, that, that's not your fault then, is it, if they haven't given it to you? So, you know, I, 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 I would say I'm agnostic on, on that. Um, and I also say, they, they, they said it's very important that um, the uh, self-employed people understand us. But also, it's also very important for them to understand you. So, I mean, it's, it's a two-way thing, isn't it? So to conclude then, what did they think made a good self-employed person, external specialist? 
qualifications, experience, and a proven track record, not surprisingly. A reputation for quality of work, professionalism, professionalism, and delivery on time. Commercial awareness and reliability. And a good communicator. In other words, a professional. And I think you could, you could um, apply that to just about any profession. Um, but just to come back to archaeology, um, I think that we have to do all that. Yeah, but we're not IT specialists. We have to do all that and we have to tell a story and we have to understand the past and we have to help each other to understand the past. So we've got an extra challenge. Uh, we have to do both. So good luck. I'll leave your <laughs>